John, thank you so much on behalf of the Sessions to come by and spend some time with us. We're in Vegas. I know you're out with Elton. It's absolutely great, the show, the energy. It is. And between percussion and vocals, even though you're also a drum set player, you've got your hands filled with all that you do. This is powerful what you're doing. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask you, where, where did it begin for you? How did music enter your life? I thought about that a little bit uh, this morning. Um, my mother, uh, I lived in you know, Canton, Ohio, right? Yeah. She bought somewhere at like a, a yard sale or something, a Magnus chord organ. <laughs> if you remember, that's plastic, about this big, yes. little keyboard, and over here it had these buttons that were chords, yeah. right? And, and she had the book and everything, the book. <laughs> and I remember one of the songs in the book was words by the Bee Gees. You know, words are words are all I had to take your heart away. And, you know, and I just went through there, and it was really easy to see the notes, you know, because the notes were marked, yeah. and, and hit this chord, change a chord. And every day, I don't know how this happened to me, but when I would come home from school, straight to that thing, and I would try to play a song. <laughs> every day. And I was like, I don't even know where I got that from. I mean, my dad, uh, my dad's, you know, Irish cop, yeah. singer, played a little trumpet, you know. So I think he had the music gene in him yeah but I love to just come home and play that and then from there you know uh, my dad who was a cop took my two brothers and I my two older brothers to the uh, pol he, uh, the police boys club is where he would dump us on Saturdays to get <laughs> to get rid of us right <laughs> so he took us to the police boys club and they were starting a drum and bugle corps I'm, I'm familiar with that okay. the PBA had had so many things that they did for their communities so yeah now you're playing and music. he took me uh, and they took the three of us. I have, my older brothers like are each about two years older than me, right? We're all close. Four of us, very close in age. Four boys and then two girls. Um, took us down there, and he and we went in this room, and they had drums, like marching drums, and trumpets and flugelhorns. And he goes, "What do you want to play? The drum or the flugelhorn?" I went, "I'm not putting that, I'm not putting that in my mouth. That looks cool. Blue and white sparkle, brand new Ludwig marching drug with a white strap. You know, I'm like." That's, I'm gonna play the drums. So we, that day, went down in the basement to the wood shop yeah. and built a practice pad, which I still have, actually. A wooden practice pad okay. about that big with a little slat, and they bought these pieces of rubber that we glued to the top of it. Yeah. <laughs> Put your name on it with a wood burner. <laughs> I still have it, man. That's incredible. It's so great. Yeah. And so, yeah, from there, I started playing the little marching. We da 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 you know. <laughs> uh, but here's the best part of the story. That police boys club is now the DCI Blue Coats, the world champions that is of amazing. this year. Yeah. They went on to become, you know, I mean, we were just walking around with baseball hats and, you know, shorts, yeah. basically. Um, it wasn't, it was serious, but not that serious. It was yeah. a weekend thing. And then some, I'm not sure who took it over, but somebody got involved in donations and then and they the joined the, the DCI. And the Drum Corps International. This thing is really seriously, professionally upgraded. These guys are fine-tuned. I went to see the semifinal last summer in Maslin, Ohio. And, and right, and they won this year. So, so they're the champs, which is amazing. <laughs> so I met the, some guys there, and I tried to tell them I'm a member of the original. <laughs> no, you're not. Man. It started in blah blah blah. Like, and, and I go, no, it, it actually. This is where it actually started. And I have the black and white picture of the band, you know, That's with great. the bass drums and everything. It's a police boys club. But it's amazing to have that kind of history to go back and kind of see where it started. So, how'd you get involved? From there into uh, well, you, from taking there, lessons? You know, yeah, I, I joined the high school or the, the grade school band, yeah. like when I was probably 13, you know, and then I moved into high school band. Um, and I started, I took like uh, snare drum lessons from one of the older kids there. I was in the marching band in high, in high school, and the band director, who I later got to become pretty good friends with, he wanted me to play the bass drum. I guess I had good time, and in that band, you know, that was where that you're the timekeeper when you're yeah. in a marching band. The guy yeah. that's playing the bass drum, he's driving the ship. He's driving the ship. Really. Absolutely. So um, I pretty much played that in marching band, and then I joined uh, the choir because because um, my parents insisted that I was in the choir at, at church, right, the Catholic church. So I sang in the choir there, and then I joined the high school choir, and then the high school orchestral band, which was. Kind of the same as the marching band. Well, it's kind of interesting. So, so the performing and the singing kind of happened at the same time. Kind of happened at the same time. I always, you know, I guess because my parents kicked me into, you know, you want to be in the church choir, and yeah. I think it all has happened at the same time, That's right? Smart. I didn't really think of it as being a singer. I just thought of it as you just sang. It was just part of 
the performance of it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and that kind of moved into like in the orchestral band. I was I played timpani. I just kind of self-taught myself, you know, because you know there's that note. You got to <laughs> tune this and. There wasn't, you know, the band director had to kind of teach me how to play the timpani, really. I didn't really take any lessons on it or anything. Yeah. I didn't really play the snare drum that much. I had moved away from that. I was playing the timpani and the other little uh, parts and the concert bass drum and stuff like that. Still in the choir, and then I wound up getting one of the leads, uh, the vocal, the singing lead in the, like, the theater in the, in the senior play. So now, okay, now I'm actually... Now I have to actually sing. Right? So, <laughs> so that was a good thing, though. That was a good thing. It helped, um, you know, it helped me really go, okay, I can do this. Yeah, for sure. So, the, so the, the school, the importance of the school music program is what we're talking about here. In many is. of these interviews, they have said that. It is. Unfortunately, now we're starting to lose some of those programs, which is a shame because yeah. here you came out of that. You were blessed to have that opportunity and that in your community. And that kind of opened you up for the future that you have now when you think about it. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if I think about if that wasn't there, which way would I have gone, right? right? I mean, and at the same time that I was doing all that stuff in high school, I had my older brother who wound up playing saxophone. He had a, like a funk horn band that he was in. <laughs> so that was a whole other inspiration for me because they had a drummer, but when that drummer couldn't make it or, you know, I would come in, sit in, and practice, or just, or they would just let me jam with them one time. They had three horns, like three singers, and they played like Chicago tunes, great. Blood, Sweat, and Tears, great. James Brown, you know, uh, you know, seven funky Catholic white boys, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so they, but that uh, one of those guys in that band, he put a little band together after they sort of broke up, and he asked me to be in the band. So he was a couple years older than me, a piano player. So we started doing like weekend gigs when I was probably a senior in high school. So now but you're getting called, you're getting paid now. You're getting paid for... Now I'm getting paid. But okay. that band, I have to say that band of my brothers, it turned me on to, well, first of all, Chicago. Yeah. Forget about it. Yeah. Talk about an inspiration. Absolutely. You know, everything you could possibly want Absolutely. in music, from arrangements to vocals to melodies to... Incredible from jazz drumming. to rock to the uh, beginning of fusion, the way they played. Yeah, yeah and then you put blood, sweat, and tears on top of that, and then you get Earth, Wind, and Fire later. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing just gets more and more lucky to have music Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah. we were so lucky to have music like that. So basically, yeah. I bought in those years, like probably my senior year in high school or something like that. I had as much Chicago records and. And I would sit in the basement with the headphones and play along to these records. And that's kind of the beginning of how I learned the drum set, yeah. was playing along to records and going to see my brother's band, you know, um, and doing these little weekend gigs. And like you say, yeah, now I'm starting to go, oh, hey, uh, 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but look at the, the two of the greatest drummers that you listen to, Denny Serafin from Chicago and Bobby Columbia from Blood, Sweat and Tears. These guys really were, were Kind of jazz players now playing rock, yeah. So they brought you know great creativity to rock. It wasn't just you know, laying down a groove. These guys were spicing up the music and really yeah. kind of pushing it. go, take it, go, take Children say, yeah. you know, there aren't drum solos in music anymore in Absolutely. pop music. You know, uh, how brilliant! It was know, just brilliant. Make me smile. That's make me smile, isn't yeah. it? The drum solo, right? Right. <laughs> the sweet, right? Absolutely, I mean, man. Come on. <laughs> but we all, you know, as, as a drummer myself, we all kind of were attracted to that because yeah. of the excitement. Isn't it great that we still get inspired by that? Absolutely. I still go, oh, God. Oh, man, all that. the blood, sweat, and tears. God bless the child. They go into this oh, yeah. Latin new part, and then all of a sudden they're into the fast jazz thing. Yeah. And this was on you know, AM radio. Yeah. So music, being yeah. around that kind of music, and that's what, you know, the, the Sessions interviews, it's about that next level of these kids that are watching this, that are hearing these names of these bands, mm -hmm. that to this point we still can be inspired. Here you are still, you know, acknowledging that pattern, that groove. It's so ingrained in our soul. Yeah. There are bands, you know, like, like Bruno Mars is cut, touching On the cutting the edge, edge bit, absolutely, yeah. You know, yeah. playing like really interesting arrangements and yeah. letting it fly a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I love that. After I got out of high school, then I realized, all right, I need to, you know, I started playing with guys that were older than me, yeah. better than me. We started playing jazz, and I realized all I could do was go tank, tank-a-dang, tank-a-dang, you know. <laughs> and, 
At the same time, I got interested in playing a little bit of mallets. Mm. I don't know why. I worked at this music store and I was uh, helping them do sales and teaching. By this time, by I was out of school, I was teaching like, you know, beginners, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and then some little vibraphone came in, the, the, like a two and a half octave thing. And the guy goes, you want that? Yeah, hundred bucks. Okay, bought it. And I couldn't play it. So I started taking lessons from this girl uh, that was in going to Kent State University or something like that in the percussion program. So, so I got interested in that in a little bit and then they had all these other percussion instruments at the store. And I think working at that music store, I, you know, oh, a guitar, I'll pick that up. How do you play that chord? Yeah. I like this, you know, and, and I, but I think that's really where I got to see more of the percussion instruments because yeah. Yeah. I didn't study percussion that much. I was more into the kit, you know. Right. But when I started playing with these jazz guys, that's when one of them who had, and he, you know, he moved back to Canton, he was a burning tenor player. Yeah. And he just looked at us and he goes, you guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> you guys suck. And, and I remember him reading this, the riot act one day. We talk about inspiration. This is Al Wittig, his name is. He, he, he's still, you know, he's in Richmond, Virginia. He went through the Air Force. He just retired from the Air Force. So he was in the Air Force uh, performance band thing. He came back and we tried to play these tunes and he goes, look, you guys, he sat down and he goes, if you guys aren't studying with someone, yeah. you know, if you're not uh, taking private lessons, if you're not practicing eight hours a day, every day, you don't have a prayer. What, what great advice. I went, I remember going to Cleveland, hearing this guy, Pat Pace, this great jazz piano player, he had a little trio. I met this guy, Bill Severance, um, who also moved to LA and he was left-handed and right-handed. And I went, do you teach? And he goes, yeah, I live in like, not far from my house. And you're ambidextrous. Yeah, I mean, right not totally, left. but I'm, you know, I write left-handed, yeah. I throw left-handed, I play tennis right-handed. Right. I eat whichever hand I can get. <laughs> Salad and soup left-hand, <laughs> meats from the right hand. <laughs> my wife goes, what's the matter with you? <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's like, I think it's because I had all these older brothers, you know, golfing, I play right-handed because right-handed clubs were at the house. Yeah, kind of yeah. So yeah, so I'm a switcher, you know. Okay. But, uh, but Bill, he, was, he had just spent a year or two at Berkeley, right, with the Alan Dawson Great. drum program. There's another name, a beautiful right? guy, yeah. So I went to study with him. It turned out he only lived like a half an hour from me. Great, mm -hmm. perfect, out in the country somewhere. So we did the, the Ted Reed syncopation book. Absolutely, yeah. Right? And, uh, and he had all these exercises all ready to go. Page one, the syncopation, do da 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 you know, the rhythm, and this right? was all the Alan Dawson concept. Alan had about 50 different ways of going through just that one book. Yeah, the somp, keep the samba, play the page, play the page with your foot. Exactly right, Play the yeah. page with your hi-hat. Exactly right, yeah. Well, Bill said, okay, we've done it right-handed, now we do it left-handed. Smart. Ride the left hand, right. play with the right hand. I mean, it's harder for me to still do it now to switch that easy. Yeah. But back then when I was studying, I could do you it. You had it, you yeah. know. You know, and filling all those those triplets in between the mm -hmm. rhythms. Remember that you do that exercise? Absolutely. Oh my God. It's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. But he was adamant about the lessons, you know. I, every Saturday I took a lesson from him. Then I'd go home and I would practice six to eight hours, five days Beautiful. a week. Beautiful. That's when I didn't have a day job because I had a day job for a while in a lumber yard. Yeah. <laughs> You worked. I worked. Yeah. You hustled. It's, it's, it's amazing that you hustled that hard. Yeah, I worked in the lumber yard, uh, like you know, eight to four or something like that, five days a week, winter and summer. It was brutal, man. <laughs> and at night, like three or four days a week, I would play in this club band from like ten to two. So very little sleep. <laughs> Probably crazy days, you know. But that, I mean, look, look at how driven you were as far as yeah, you know, I, the time or two and you would. Yeah. Studying, taking lessons. So now you're you're becoming more aware of the instrument. You're getting more confidence, obviously, because of all this here. What was the next step? How'd you get into the more of the professional career? Well, I think at that step, you know, these older guys, they were just a couple years older than me. They came to me one day when I was working at that lumber yard, and the guy goes, "Dude, just join my band. You're out of here." You know, <laughs> it was almost like he was telling me, "You're quitting this job, and we're going to do this full time." Yeah. Because I was playing three or four nights a week and making, you know. 150 bucks or something like that. Uh, and I was working 40 hours a week making 100 bucks yeah. at the lumber yard, you know, smashing my fingers every five yeah, minutes, yeah. right? Hello. So <laughs> they said, look, that's it, you're just quitting, you're coming with us. And I just went, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I went with them and then it got a little more serious where we, we started actively not only uh, put together like a top 40 band that we knew could make money, right? right? 
we still had our jazz band on the side with some of the same guys, but now I have to, oh, now I'm the singer as well as, you know, everybody in the band's got to sing. That was like a rule, pretty much. Everybody has to do a song. So we took it a lot more serious, and we actually aggressively went out and looked for work, mm. which is a whole other part of the business that's, it's not even got anything to do with music. Yeah. You know, you're talking some guy in the basement with his gun on the table wanting to pay you at two o'clock <laughs> in the morning. I've done that, you know. But this is a very important part about the business side of what we deal with. There's the artistic side and the business side. Mm -hmm. That's kind of really what the, the sessions is about. It's about understanding that you can be great at your art form, but if you don't understand the business side, where you have to go and collect the money and have discussions and yeah. have the communication skills to speak to these people. Yeah, and deal with booking agents. Absolutely. You know? And it, it, it's not that it was so difficult, but yeah. it was a whole nother area that no one ever told me about or no one ever said, you know, here's what you do. So honestly, I don't even know how I wound up working with booking agents to get the gigs. But I did know in my local area, I would just go to a club. Yeah. Hey, man, I have a band. You know, we, can we play here? Blah, blah, blah. Sure. You know, and some of them were rough places. Like I said, the one guy that would always have to, he was giving me like $200 and he's got to have the gun on the table. I'm like, come on, man. Why the gun? You know? A great intimidation. It was, technique, yeah, like right? I'm going to grab that and run. Oh, but I'm playing here next week. I'll give you the money back. Oh, man. But uh, you just sort of learned as you went, you know, then you, the, the bigger better gigs, like let's say some of these gigs were five nights a week at a nice hotel, you know, in the days when there was a band at the Holiday Inn every night, right, five right. days a week, yeah. there was a booking agent involved that you had to start dealing with and he took a commission and and now all of a sudden you've got to get a calendar and you've got to become professional, like start okay. writing down, is, hey, I'm booked here and I'm yeah. not booked here. And that part of it was a real learning experience because some people didn't want to, some people didn't understand why do we have to use a booking agent and you know what I mean and it's that's where the whole business thing but this really is the business skill that can allow us to be successful and here you are now with Elton performing and playing you've got to be professional and be on time and you've got to act in a way that is absolutely at a high standard yeah, yeah and that's that's why you're with Elton yeah you've obviously you know raised your game so what you learned in those experiences really helped you out yeah. here when you tell somebody you're gonna do something first of all you have to do it right, right? and like our old mate, Bob Birch, our old bass player, he always told me, on time is late. Yeah. If you're on time, you're late in my book. You know, if early is on time, yeah. on time is late. And he was always early for everything. Great lesson. And, you know, and there's, there's nothing worse in, in the music business than guys like, oh man, I'm like, I'm gonna be an hour late. You know, yeah. or something like that. Or especially guys when you're late for a gig. And yeah, then, yeah. A lot of people, they don't take that seriously, yeah. but that's the, the weird part about the music business. It is a business, you know, yeah. it's, and, uh, you know, being on, being on time and being, you know, just persistent about keeping yourself together, you know, looking good and, you know, taking care of yourself and, and taking care of your, your instruments, yeah. the whole thing, it's all part of it. It's so... Uh, so that falls under that professionalism that, that... It's crazy because people, they do judge you quickly in this business, you know, people look at you and go, bam, you know, what car are you driving? Or, yeah. you know, are you, is your, are your drums falling apart? I yeah. remember <laughs> showing up on, with some really crappy drums one time and never thought anything of it. I thought, oh, you know, they, they sound good and everything and they, they were crap, you know? <laughs> and I remember some guy going, you know, isn't it about time you like uh, up the game a little bit? <laughs> some guitar player, some just called me out on a gig and I thought, God, no wonder I haven't been called very much. People are like looking at my drums and thinking I'm just some guy off the street with a, you know, uh, a kit that's falling apart that I had painted or something, right? <laughs> but what great life lessons and business lessons you learned in the course of this process. Yeah. I mean, this really is amazing. You know, this is a, the, these next generation that watch these interviews and kind of understand that to a degree they're stepping into your life. They're feeling what you went through. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this is eye-opening for them to see, well, I've got to maybe up my game. Yeah. You know, back in those days, like I told you, I had a day job, I worked at night. That sort of carried over from like, I think from my father, because not, not only was he a cop, but he had all these other side jobs, you know. Yeah. That was never enough. He always had to get a job here and a job on the weekend. Yeah. And this, so I, I think what I learned from that is I never turned down any work. If it was at all possible, if I could do that gig, sometimes I didn't get paid on some gigs, I would just take the gig 
because of the doors that it could open up. Just, and and I mean, that old crazy saying, who you know is everything, or yeah, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. it's so important, man. It's so important just to, uh, just showing up sometimes mm -hmm. and going like, you know, because uh, who you know can be everything, really. Are there any regrets that you have in the course of coming up yes. where you are? Yes, the very thing we're talking about. I regret not maybe shooting a little higher sometimes, mm -hmm. like like taking a chance to meet someone. Um, I remember being backstage in, uh, at, I think it was a uh, Missing Persons concert, and someone had given me a backstage pass and I was and I couldn't go meet Terry, right? Yeah, Terry Bozio at the time. Yeah, and yeah. when I finally got backstage and he was busy and he was talking to people, and I thought, you know, I'm not gonna go do that, you know? I kicked myself for the times where I could have introduced myself right. to someone, or I kicked myself for the times when I maybe should have looked Especially living in LA, right, yeah. where a lot of bands will culminate, and 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 they have a management company, and they have a record company, and I sort of kick myself for not going right to the source sometimes, to to knock on a door, right, yes. to go right to the management company and say, hey, here's my resume, here's my stuff, this is who I am, I'm looking for work, as opposed to always waiting for someone else to call me. What a great, great piece of advice. And that, yeah. I wasted a lot of years in LA, I think, and when I look back on it, that I could have been maybe upped my game a little bit right. more by me going out and cracking doors open and not being afraid to, oh, I don't want to interrupt that person or I'm not good enough to play with that band or I'm not good enough to, you know, they're way above my level. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's so, so weird, man, yeah. because now that I'm, I hate to say it, but now that I'm, at this other level, I don't look at myself like being at that other level, but I am realistically, yeah, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And then I see how people look at me now, and it's changed everything for me. But, but you know what's amazing about it is a guy like Terry Bozio, who is an absolute sweetheart of a person, great, great musician, he probably would have welcomed you easily. So it's amazing that that, that bit of advice to, to have the confidence to, to go for it. Just exactly, just have the confidence to go for it. And I tell, you know, all young people that I meet now, especially my nieces and nephews, you got nothing to lose, man. You're like, what, 22 years old? You've got your whole life to screw up. Yeah, yeah. So start yeah. screwing up now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Go buy something you can't afford, you know? Go go knock on that door. Run yeah. up to Obama and go, hey, man, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> That's amazing. You got nothing to lose. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You know, as these, this young generation watches this and, and, and get a feel for it, in closing, what would you say to the next generation? Here you are, John, You've, you're traveling the world now with Elton for many, many years. You're playing with some of the finest musicians on stage. Elton, the legend of Elton John. I mean, just think yeah, about it. He you know, is a legend. You, you know, like in Elvis, we say Elvis, and now we say Elton, and that's all, it's all you need to get the impact of what he's had in his music. Yeah. You're on stage playing in front of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. What can you say to this next generation that can give them hope and excitement for them to pursue their passion in music? I mean, like what we were talking about, like don't be afraid to jump over, man. Don't be afraid to go over that next. You know, you see the stepping stones across the river, give them a try. Worst thing happened, you fall in the water, yeah, you know? Uh, so uh, I, when I went to LA, when I moved from Ohio to LA, it was my drum teacher, Bill Severance, yes. that he moved out there and he kept calling me, man, you gotta get out of Ohio, you gotta get out of Ohio. I'm thinking, oh, LA, I don't know anyone. My cousin lives in San Bernardino or something. That's <laughs> it, I don't know anybody except Bill moved there. Yeah. And so we basically packed up all our stuff, my wife and I, we had just got married. I said, you want to move to LA? She goes, yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Sold everything I owned, threw some stuff in a pickup truck, drove across the country, you know, and Bill started uh, throwing me casuals here and there, you know, and opening up doors. But if I wouldn't have taken that, that was a huge leap. That was for some, to drive across the country yeah. by yourself and maybe I even, I was 28 when I did that, I think. Nice. Maybe she even should have done it earlier. Yeah. But I think that's the thing is don't be afraid to, you know, just to be yourself and to play the way you play, right? Because that, I didn't really change anything that I played with. I mean, I when I went to LA, I wound up studying with David Garibaldi for a couple beautiful, of years, beautiful. you know. At the Dick Grove I went workshop. to Dick Grove. I went there also many, yeah, many a little bit. I studied th music theory. Right. And but you tried a variety of experiences. I explored. Yeah, That's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. I, I wasn't afraid to go play with this kind of band or play with that kind of band. And maybe I wasn't the perfect player for every band. Yeah. 
but I can't say I ever really got fired from any of those bands, so I must have been doing something right. right. And, and, and I think about that thing you're talking about singing, you got to learn another instrument besides, you know, it, whether it's a little piano or something or singing has helped my career like I can't tell you how much. Maybe. I mean, I don't think I would, I know I wouldn't be where I am now because it was the singing that actually got me the gig, not the playing. I mean, Davey, uh, who I think you interviewed yesterday, yeah. he knew that I was a player, you yeah. know, that I could play percussion and drums and all this other stuff, but he didn't know about my singing that well. Yeah. So he hired me to do a recording session smart guy to figure out really how can this guy sing right <laughs> so he hired me and I sang two songs for him uh, just some demos that he was working on and then I never heard back from him and then like two months later he called and said hey I, I need somebody in the band that can play percussion electronics drums if they need to play drums and can do a lot of singing you interested <laughs> <laughs> so you know it was really that that yeah. kind of cracked the door open and I think if you just you know, if you put blinders on and I'm just going to do this, or I'm, I'm just going to be a guitar player, or I'm just going to play the piano, I think that's that's good. But if you, you still got to branch out a little bit because you don't know where that next opportunity, which way it's going to come from, right? Yeah. You know, one day it could be sunny and one day it could be cloudy. And <laughs> somebody might say, "Can you do this?" Well, it, it's that fine line, right? You yeah, know what I'm talking absolutely. about? Because absolutely. Because do you want to just, I mean, there's people that do one thing and they're so good at it and yeah. it just makes you go, my God, they're so good at it. But, you know, there's other people that, like me, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm the type of person that if I just said, I'm just going to be a drummer, where I would be right now. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I don't want to preach and say that's what you should do. Oh, you're saying widening, widening your, your talents and your abilities can yeah. widen more opportunities. That's really... It just widen your whole view of the music business itself as to, as to... I see guys come out of music school and they just want to be players. And I think the, the, music, the business is changing so rapidly yeah. and so much that just wanting to be a player now is not enough, you know, uh, to, to learn, you know, where money's being made in the music industry. And what we're seeing now is maybe film and television and you know people are making money that way now yeah. because now there's 150 television channels out yeah, there right, right. plus the internet absolutely you know absolutely. when you and i were young it was it three was channels non it was non-existent so as the industry has changed what you're saying is be aware of the change of the industry be aware of many more opportunities that could be given to you if you widen that skill base yeah. and it's talent you know you hear you, you know, listen and here you are now playing percussion, singing, yeah. doing all this stuff with Elton for many, many years. And it really, just that one call yeah. to go into that studio and sing opened up a whole nother lifetime of it adventure did. for you. It's been fantastic. And saying that, I can't tell you how many times that Elton has said to me, like at a rehearsal or something, hey, can you play blah, blah, blah right here? Can you give me this, I want this sound yeah. right here in the song? And I have to go, all right, that's an electronic thing. I need to either sample it, yeah. put some kind of effect or filter on it, yeah blah, 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 or I've got that sound buried in some unit, or I've got to actually go take a microphone, and, which I've done <laughs> in my hotel room. <laughs> you know, in, in Benny and the Jets, there's this, there's this foot, you know, uh, yeah. in Benny and the Jets, there's this foot stomping and this clap thing. And I didn't really have a good sound for that. I had a really old when somebody gave me this crap. So I went in my hotel room one night, and I, was, I took shoes on the washing machine, there was a, a strange hotel room that had like a washing machine. I don't know, <laughs> this is back in the 90s. And I took the, my shoes and I had one of these little Yamaha um, stereo recording right, right, things, devices, pocket yeah. recorders. Yeah, yeah. And I did these clop, clop, clop. And I actually sampled it that way, did it a bunch of times and layered it, you know, and then brought it in and put it in my sampler on the stage. And it was great. <laughs> I still Elton play it. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, or he will say, hey, I want you to sing this note and not this note anymore on a yeah. harmony or something like that. So it's like that constant, it's a, when somebody shoots something at you or, or we, you know, how about putting marimba line on this part? Not to go, oh, wow, I haven't played marimba in a while, you know, get out and practice that thing and play it. But So you're being tested, you're being, you know, put on the spot. That improvisational request of creativity is yeah. really an incredible, incredible excitement that allows you to continue with Elton, and I know he changes things around when yeah. he plays. And Let's he see. tells you when he doesn't like it. Yeah. You know, and that's another huge part people don't understand is when somebody said, that sucked, all right, and he doesn't pull any punches, like yeah. I'll do something, 
and he'll go, he'll be playing, he'll go, who's doing that thing? I'll go, oh, that, that's me, that's that part you wanted. And he goes, he goes, that's not good, don't do that. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Hence, you change the part, right. <laughs> yeah, but, but you gotta be able to take a punch, Adapt too. Adapt yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a great message with, with this generation to kind of hear the fact that you have to be adaptable and you've gotta be improvisational, you know, on, on your feet all the time and be yeah. able to change. And take criticism. And yeah. take criticism. Take criticism and not take it personal because usually you are working for someone that loves their music so much that has spent so much time writing a song, creating a song, they know what they, they have it in here, what they want it to sound like, and then you're bringing your color to that, but <clears throat> maybe you're bringing blue and he really hears purple. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so when he says, that's not doing it, that's not, you know, and sometimes people get passionate, I won't say pissy about yeah, it, they yeah, get passionate yeah. about it. That's not what I wanted, that's not right, you know. Can you do something different? And if you start taking that personal, man. It's a, this, this is and, not the and, industry and to have you that. Know that yeah, you absolutely. know this well because yeah. how many times you just, and it can be so subtle. Yeah. It can be like, somebody can just simply go, ah, it's not quite working. And they're not giving you advice or telling you what to do. Yeah. And that is one of the most difficult things, I think, is when someone criticizes you, but it's not a corrective, criticism it's just simply a criticism like I don't like that yeah. or uh, you know can you do something a little different yeah just in that moment yeah, yeah you have yeah. to go oh, <laughs> <laughs> or you have to go okay a little different try, you know? <laughs> well that is fantastic advice John and I thank you on behalf of the sessions to have the time to do this here good luck on stage performing keep doing what you're doing because it really is at a very high standard oh thank you I appreciate thank you it, so man. much thank you <laughs>